So how can you and I trust anyone? And Jesus wants to answer that question this morning on how to see life. I understand that here in the United States, about every 20 minutes, a person goes blind. I used to say when I was, I was a risk manager, I used to tell people, you know, uh, most of you are going to die five miles from within your house address. Of course, people would be quick to want to move out of their house. I wish it were that simple. But today we're going to look at a chapter. It's obviously a long story in chapter 9 of the Gospel of John. The story is about a blind man and their various characters, of course, Jesus, his disciples, the blind man, his parents, the religious leaders, and the crowd. And what is interesting about this story is the one person who gets it after it's all said and done, guess who it is? The blind man. And so we want to look at four things that are challenges for us and four things that are warnings for us. And most of us don't like warnings, right? But when the officer stops you and says, you were speeding and I caught you going 69 on a 55, we smile when he says, I'm only going to give you a warning today. Oh, yes, thank you, Lord, right? Warnings are good. A tornado warning is better than a tornado at your house, right? Challenges are good. For most, some of us who played sports, maybe you had a coach that pushed you a little bit, challenged you, but as a result, you were able to go a lot further to greater heights because you had someone pushing you. That's what Jesus wants to do for us today. So if you feel when you walk out today, Pastor Ray, stretch me a little bit. Just remember, it's not me, it's the Lord speaking, all right? But it's one of those stories that you can gloss over and feel like, hey, that was a really good story. I feel good. But I want you to think twice about this story because there's a lot of sobering truth here. And so the first nugget of truth is beware of closed-minded thinking. Closed-minded thinking is a serious thing. Let's look at the story as it starts. As he went along, meaning Jesus, he saw a blind man from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned? This man or his parents, that he was born blind. Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus. But this happened so that the work of God might be displayed in his life. As long as it is day, we must do the work of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. How do close-minded people think? Well, let me show you, uh, share with you another story that helps reflect that. It's a story about a guy who fell into a pit and he couldn't get himself out. But a subjective person came by and looked at him and saw him and says, wow, I really feel for you down there. Then an objective person came by and he said, it is logical that someone would fall down there. Then a Pharisee came by and said, ha, no surprise, only po- bad people fall into pits like this. And then a mathematician came by, by and all he did was calculate how, how deep the pit was. But then, of course, a news reporter came by and said, I want the exclusive story on this pit. And then, of course, you always got to throw our IRS in there somewhere. So an agent said, hey, are you paying taxes on this pit? And then a self-pitying person also went by and he said, you haven't seen anything yet until you've seen my pit. Then a Christian scientist observed, and he said, the pit is just in your mind. Of course, then a psychologist said, you know what? You have your mother and dad to blame for this pit. But then again, the self-esteem therapist came by, and he said, ah, just believe in yourself, and you can get out of the pit. The optimist looked. He said, things could be worse. The pessimist looked. He said, things will get worse. Then Jesus came by, and Jesus simply stretched out his hand and lifted him up out of the pit. You see, closed-minded people want to analyze it, talk about it, explain it. They want to just have this long discourse. But the open-minded person like Jesus, he's got something else in mind. We ain't got time to talk. We need to solve this problem. See, Jesus wants to do something 
about life. See, Jesus is about faith, and faith is about action, and he performed 100% in 100% perfection with this thing called faith like we never could. Do you know any close-minded people? Some of the most close-minded people aren't necessarily non-religious people. They're religious people. Did you know that? First of all, the disciples attributed this man's blindness to a condition that supposedly the child had caused for themselves before they were blind, or at least that was the thought of the day. I don't know. Maybe the baby kicked mommy on the tummy and up, oh, you're going to be born blind because you sin in the womb. Of course, there were other thoughts out there about what the cause could be. Some would say, well, it's obvious that mom and dad did something. Maybe they had sex out of marriage and now they're paying for it. They're going to get a baby that's born blind. Here's the point. Isn't it kind of funny, silly, maybe even ridiculous that we can spend so much time, waste so much time on theology, theological discussion that arrives at nothing? When Jesus is saying, when are you going to do something about it? When are we going to talk, stop talking about it and put our faith in action and be part of the solution? See, when the disciples walked by, they saw, eyes, the guy as an object lesson for discussing theology. When Jesus walked by, he saw a person, a person with an obvious need, and Jesus had compassion and Jesus acted on it. You see the difference? How do we see life? Jesus wants to remove the blindness that comes with our physical sight. But it's going to require that we receive spiritual sight. To see things the way he sees things. That we be willing to listen to this higher power called God on how we can do something about it. See, the disciples were wasting time looking for answers to wrong assumptions. For Jesus, who is at fault? That's not the question. In fact, Jesus doesn't even focus on the man's past. Jesus focused on the man's present. Have you noticed how much time we can waste regarding our past? And Jesus doesn't want to talk about our past. He wants to talk about so what are you going to do now as a result of what you've learned from your past? You see the difference? We ask God a multiple question. God, is it A, B, or C? And God answers D. None of the above. So why was this guy born blind? Jesus says, so that the work of God might be displayed in his life. Do you remember the story that Jesus would come, this Messiah, this deliverer? And one of the signs that would prove his credentials would establish that he is, in fact, who God said he was going to be, is that he would be able to do what? To give sight to the blind. And this guy is one of those examples of what God had already prophesied was going to be happening. And it would hopefully point people to the hand of God. And so, we have to be willing then to see life from God's point of view. Maybe you're a single today. I know we have a few singles. And maybe you're asking, God, just give me my dreams. Just make them come true or just go ahead and let me die right now. God does neither. Why? Because God has a different plan. Maybe you're married and you're saying, God... Just change my husband, or I'm going to trade him in for a new one. And what does God do? Neither. Why? Because his will has laid out a different plan. So if we're going to see spiritually, we have to be open-minded to God's light. Otherwise, we're going to be making circles in the dark and then wonder why we haven't gotten anywhere. And Jesus is trying to point out something from this story that we need to listen to. 
that we need to learn from. So beware of being closed-minded, but also beware of not following through on what God asks you to do. And now we've been talking about that this whole series, right? What did Mary say? Just do whatever Jesus tell you, tells you to do, and I granted you will have some wine. It sounds like such a simple thing to do. You remember what Jesus said? He said many would follow him in the story of the parable of the soils, but he also said, if you looked at it from a mathematical standpoint, that 75% of the people who began to follow him would not succeed in following through. That's three out of four people who started wouldn't finish the race of faith. You know anybody like that? It shouldn't surprise us. It shouldn't shock us. Because Jesus says, listen, you got to follow through. The story continues. And, of course, Jesus has, has just said, I am the light of the world. And then he says the following. Heaven said this. He spit on the ground, made some mud with the saliva, and put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam. This word means sent. So the man went and washed and came home seeing. And Jesus here, we see him as a people person. We see him as somebody who cares. We see his character. We see his divine nature. And that divine nature actually sees what people are going through. And he wants to do something about it. He's not doing miracles to show off. He's doing miracles to confirm his loving character. What were his instructions? They were real simple. When you look at the Bible and you see miracles, a lot of times you realize extraordinary act by just following some simple instructions. You remember the story of Moses? What did God tell him? It was real simple. Take your staff and stretch it out. And guess what happened? The Red Sea opened up, creating a path by some simple instructions being followed. Same is true as here. But we have to ask the question, no matter the instructions, are we willing to listen? Are we willing to respond? Are we willing to obey? Are we willing to trust the one who's given the instructions? In our culture today, people make decisions every day. And one of the greatest motivations for the, the way our culture makes decisions is how you feel. How you feel. I was getting my hair cut this week. He's been cutting my hair for over 10 years. And I said, so uh, I asked him. He's, uh, he's a Christian, not, not a Baptist, but he follows Christ. And I said, so what do you do if a Buddhist, let's say, comes to you and says, well, I see you're a Christian. It really seems to be working for you. What do you tell him? And he said in his accent, oh, I just tell him to, you know, to trust his heart. And I said, oh, really? I said, well, uh, hey, do you have a Bible? He said, oh, I never read the Bible. I said, well, uh, did you know that the Bible says that we should not trust our heart because it is the most deceitful thing above all things? He said, really? I said, yeah. God is going to punish you for giving wrong advice. No, I didn't tell him that. <laughs> but I had him thinking. I don't talk God every time I get my hair cut, but if there's an opportunity, you know, I'll plant a seed. So later I send him a, a little article on the matter, and he responded and said, hey, thank you very much. I'll, I'll take a read. Faith is not about what we feel. I'm going to serve one day. I'm just waiting for that feeling. That day will never come. I feel that God told me this. Well, that could be questionable. Why? Faith is not about what we feel. Faith is about what we do in response to the instructions. Do you see the difference? And so we got to be careful. Here we have this man. We do not know how far he had to walk. We do not know if he had to overcome some obstacles along the path. We don't know if somebody actually helped him. We don't know a lot of details about his story, but this we know. He did exactly what Jesus told him to do, to go and wash his eyes at that particular pool. 
You see, he was clear about the destination, and the destination was not really a pool. It was his sight. What is your destination today? God, just give me a big house. God, just make it easy for me. God, just do this, just do that. And, you know, I think sometimes God just smiles and says, I'm still waiting for you to follow my simple instructions. So, God wants us to follow through on what he's already said. So that we can arrive at the desired outcome. So that we can say, life does happen, but at the same time, God happens. And when I follow through, I experience breakthrough. Otherwise, I should not anticipate no breakthrough. But notice what else. Beware of raising the wrong questions. Do you like asking questions? A little boy said to his dad, Dad, why is the sky blue? Oh, that's a good question, son. I don't know that answer. A few minutes later, the son said, Dad, why is the grass green? Oh, you got me there, son. I don't know the answer to that one either. Son finally said, after raising several questions and dad being a little shorthanded on some answers, he said, Dad, do you mind me asking you all this question? Like, oh, no, you ask me all the questions you want. You don't ask questions, you ain't going to learn anything. Well, <laughs> yeah, he didn't learn a whole lot, even though he did ask questions. But you know what's interesting about God? He will allow us to ask questions. Visit a young man on Friday. He's 38. He had said he was going to pass. He called me to see if I would do the funeral. I told the wife we would be praying for him, and I really meant it. And yesterday he was talking. He was eating. They said he had lung damage. He wouldn't make it, but he did. And I said, so how how you feeling? He said, well, in the weeks gone by since I first learned I had COVID back in December, he was uh, he was pretty angry at God. Actually, that's pretty normal. God can handle <laughs> our angry questions. But we have to make sure we're asking the right questions. Have you been praying to God, asking for him every time you go to the store, Lord, I'm going to play my numbers. I need the numbers. <laughs> How many of you know what I'm talking about? I'm not talking about phone numbers. And you play those lottery numbers week after week, year after year, and it's been playing all life long. But you know that one day the Lord is going to provide. Let me give you a little hint. You're asking the wrong question. And that's why you don't have the right answer. See, we waste so much time on the things that are not on the mind of the Lord. But let's continue with this story. His neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begging asked, isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? Some claimed that he was. Others said, no, he only looks like him. But he himself insisted, I am that man. How then were your eyes open, they demanded. He replied, the man they called Jesus made some mud and put it on my eyes. He told me to go to Siloam and wash, so I went and washed, and then I could see. Where is this man, they asked him. I don't know, he said. These religious leaders, they were more concerned about how the miracle happened rather than who did this miracle and why did he do this miracle. Have you noticed something? About questions. I used to watch the news, I'm confessing here, and just watch, you know, the daily 5.30 p.m. news of what's going on in our country. I quit watching it, to be honest with you. You know why? It finally dawned on me that the secular media isn't really interested in uncovering the truth. They're more interested in covering up the truth. That's just me sharing. But that's nothing new. We see this happening in this story. I mean, think about it. This guy can now see the neighbors 
that used to say good morning to him every day when he walked out, being led by, the, by, the, by a parent, perhaps. This is the same guy that before he's lived in his house all his life, and now he actually gets to see what things look like in his house. This is the guy that, that can now see the city where he grew up in that he had never seen before. He can see everything. And these religious leaders are more interested in leading an interrogation that raises doubts than throwing a celebration party that affirms the facts of what has, ha has happened. That sound familiar? I guess what I'm saying is we got to wake up. We're not going to wake up unless we begin to see the way God sees. It's going to require a spiritual vision, a spiritual sight. Now, the good news is, even though some people said, ah, it never happened. This guy's always been blind. He's going to stay blind. So, it's obviously, this guy's not the guy. They just want to raise doubts. God's not overly concerned about the past. He's concerned about the future. What are we going to do right now that affects the future? Doubt blinds us to God's possibilities. God, uh, doubt blinds us to God's hand at work. He's already doing something. Whether you see it or not, he is. But if we stay on the track of asking all the wrong, wrong questions, you know what's going to happen to us? We're going to get very skeptical. We're going to get very critical. We're going to get very doubtful. And God is saying you do not want to get on that train. It leads nowhere. So beware of asking the wrong questions that only lead you to doubt. That distorts your vision. But notice what else he says. Beware of the man-made rules. You see, they could not accept that this man has done a miracle on the wrong day of the week. Imagine that. Oh, we may laugh, but, you know, we got our own rules. Right? Right? Let's go back to the story. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had been blind. Now, the day on which Jesus had made the mud and opened the man's eyes was a Sabbath, a Saturday. Therefore, the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight. He put mud on my eyes. The man replied, and I washed, and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God, nor for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others asked, how can a sinner do such, a mir do such miraculous signs? So they were divided. Finally, they turned again to the blind man. What have you say about him? It was your eyes he opened. The man replied, he's a prophet. Now, how did Jesus break the rules? Three ways, at least. First, Jesus spit on the ground. If he had spit on a rock, that would have been okay. But if he spit on, on the dirt, that's creating some action there. There's some activity there because he's now making some mud. Uh-oh, watch out. He just worked. He just broke the rules. One. Number two, he put the man on the man's eyes. Oh, that's activity. Oh, guess what? He broke the rules. He's working. Number three, guess what happened after the guy washed his eyes? Voila, the man can see. Oh, that's healing. He used mud as a healing agent. That's number three. He broke the rules. <laughs> uh, this is supposed to be funny. Uh, obviously, I'm not connecting real good right now. You see, the whole point is we are overly consumed with rules, rules, and more rules. Jesus has one rule of thumb. You know what it is? Love. Don, why should you not take my wife? Because you love me. It's not because he read in the book and says, don't commit adultery. No, it's deeper than that. It all goes back to love. I know here at Springdale, we can wear jeans to church, and we can even preach in jeans. It just so happened today I'm not wearing jeans. But not because I don't agree with the idea. I think it's a great idea. Somebody could be watching online right now, and they say, like, well, you know what? I'm not sure if I like Springdale because... I was taught that you got to wear your Sunday best every Sunday. 
And then Don says, well, I'm, I'm really sorry. I, we weren't trying to offend you. We really weren't. We just wanted to create an environment where whether rich or poor, you'd feel comfortable coming here to hear God's word. That's love. Oh, but we'd rather fight food. Uh, uh, we'd rather fight tooth and nail for the rules. What if you forgot to register on Friday? You need to go to the back because <laughs> Laura's got her whip. Okay? You need to fulfill your obligation for punishment. No big deal. We'll work around it because love is the name of the game. See, here's the issue. Jesus acted in love. He wasn't breaking any of God's laws. You know what he was doing? He was messing with the interpretation of God's laws. You see, you know where we get in trouble? It's our interpretation of God's laws, of God's words, of God's principles. We need to be careful with that. There have been plenty of people who have turned away from Jesus, not because they don't like Jesus. They don't like our rules. Because they say, that doesn't make no sense. Where'd that come from? Can't, surely it didn't come from God. But now let's turn the corner. That's four bewares. Beware of closed-minded thinking. Beware of not following through with what God asks. Beware of raising the wrong questions that only lead to doubt. Beware of the man-made rules. But what about the challenges? Notice, one, dare to overcome your fears. The Jews still did not believe that he had been blind and had received a sight until they sent for the man's parents. Is this your son, they asked. Is this the one you say was born blind? How is it that now he can see? We know he is our son, the parents answered. And we know he was born blind. But how can he, how, how, he, but how he can see now or who opened his eyes, we don't know. Ask him. He's of age. He will speak for himself. And then notice what is the thinking of the parents. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews. For already the Jews had decided that anyone who acknowledged that Jesus was the Christ would be put out of the synagogue. That was why his parents said, he is of age, ask him. What did it mean to be put out of the synagogue? You lost your social life? A sense of belonging, a sense of security, an experience of fellowship with God's people. You were publicly humili humiliated before the city as one who was an outcast, much like a leper. You think this guy really cares about all that? I mean, he just got the privilege. Are you going to throw that away? From the beginning, imagine this blind man. He ain't got no walking stick. They haven't been developed yet. Hey, uh, I'm trying to find the pole of Salaam. Can you direct me? Hey, uh, are you blind? Yeah, I'm blind. Can't you tell? Like, hey, you got mud on your eyes. Duh. And some people were actually laughing at him. Like, this, this guy's crazy. He could care less. He could care less. You know why? Someone said to him, hey, do this and you'll have your sight. And you know what he's doing? He's believing him, and he's acting on it. He doesn't care about peer pressure. He's not afraid to testify. He's not ashamed to say, this is what happened. Before I was blind, now I see. Have you noticed how fears can literally change our lives, affect our lives, paralyze our lives, strangle our lives? What are others going to say if I decide to follow Jesus? What are others going to say if they see me in my lunch reading my Bible? What are others going to say if I no longer play golf on Sunday morning, now I'm off to church? What are they going to say? Does it really matter? Apparently it didn't matter for this guy. Because he knows what he's been told. And he trusted 
this man that he couldn't see to be telling him the truth. Now, I have to admit, my hairdresser could have told me yesterday, don't ever come back and sit in my chair again. I ain't cutting your hair no more. Now, he could have said that. He could have gotten offended and said, like, who are you? He knows I'm a pastor. There's risk involved. I, th I think one of the biggest, biggest, I'm just going to be honest, one of the biggest disappointments about us Christian people is we play it safe. When God says, don't play it safe. Let's get risky. Let's put everything on the line. Because you have far more to gain than you will ever lose. If you trust me. And so, that's what we got to do. There may be some cultural losses. There may be some consequences. There may be some, oh, lost my right to go to the synagogue. But what God has to offer will far outweigh whatever I lose. And so I've got to risk everything. Because I already know that who I'm receiving the instructions for or from are trustworthy. But notice what else. There to see Jesus in my circumstance. Again, the story says, the second time they summoned the man who had been blind, give glory to God, they said, we know this man is a sinner. He replied, whether he's a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. Then they asked him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered, I've told you already and you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? <laughs> man, something tells me this, this man is, is, is like talking kind of firm to these religious leaders. Then they hurled insults at him and said, you are this fellow's disciple. We are disciples of Moses. We know that God spoke to Moses, but as for this fellow, we don't even know where he comes from. The man answered, now that is remarkable. You don't know where he comes from, yet he opened my eyes? We know that God does not listen to sinners. He listens to the godly man who does his will. You know what I told this young gentleman who is recovering from COVID? I said, do you believe that God answers prayer? He says, now I do. I mean, they're calling me to do his funeral now. I'm rejoicing that I'm actually talking to him. And he's sitting on a chair and he's eating solid food. They've ordered, they just had removed the trach from him being able to breathe through that tube. And he had another tube in his stomach where they were going to remove that so that he would no longer be fed through his stomach through the tube. The doctor said, your days are short. What did God say? No. Uh-uh, I got a different plan. Then... Nobody has ever heard of opening the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. This is the blind man talking. To this they replied, you were steeped in sin at birth. You dare, uh, how dare you lecture us? You see the closed-mindedness? What do they do? They threw him out. We're going to show you what this is going to cost you. It is by faith that we follow Jesus. But it is when our faith is proven. It is by going through testing that it becomes clear that we had real faith. Now listen to me. We can, com we can, we can claim to know all this about God. But it is only as we endure the trials of the, the testing of our faith that we prove that what we claim is really real to us. Are you listening? Nobody likes trials. But are we going to have to go through some? Yes. How else is God going to know? 
that your faith is real. And God already said through Jesus in the parable of the soils, three out of four, they're going to jump ship. He wasn't trying to discourage us. He was just being honest. We're in a spiritual war. And some people will jump ship. We've got to open our eyes. And so when closed-minded people can't debunk a message, they will always go after the messenger. Just remember that. They don't agree with what you believe, they'll come after you next. It's just part of the testing. So just accept it. See, Jesus wants to see, are you going to turn away from him or are you going to stand by him? Two options. So, what else? Dare to see Jesus in my circumstances despite the cost that it may bring upon me. But also dare not delay in making Jesus number one in my life. Wow, this is going somewhere. Again, the story says, Jesus heard that they had thrown him out. And when he found him, he said, hey, do you believe in the Son of Man? Who is he, sir? The man asked. Tell me so that I may believe in him. Jesus said, you have now seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking with you. Then the man said, Lord, I believe in you. I believe. And then it says, and he worshiped him. Why did Jesus wait until he had been put out of the synagogue to go look for him? Remember, this guy knows Jesus, but only by his voice. This guy in John chapter 9, verse 11 says, this man they call Jesus, which means Savior. In chapter 9, verse 17, he says, this man, Jesus, I think he's a prophet. And now in verse 38, now he's Lord. See, the greatest miracle in this story really wasn't the physical sight being restored. It was the fact that Jesus has now opened the eyes of his heart to see things differently, to see him not just as a miracle worker, but as the very son of God. One from God who has the power to do miracles as he already believed. You see, God can do great things. He has the power. He can heal marital relationships. He can heal grief. He can heal financial problems. He can heal so many things. But check this out. We shouldn't marvel at that very physical blessing. We should marvel at the fact that we get to see Jesus not just for what he can do, but for who he is. That is the greatest miracle. When's the last time you thought about that? That is where it's at. I mean, I think Don was right last week when he says, you know, he comes home with the kids, what you bringing, daddy? He's not looking for just that kind of appreciation. He's looking for them to say, it's our daddy. Our daddy is home. This is our daddy. That is when the smile is really big. You see what God is saying here? Is that how you see me? It takes spiritual sight to see that. And so he finishes the story on the last dare. Dare to admit my spiritual blindness. The story ends. Jesus said, for judgment have I come into this world, so that the blind will see and those who see will become blind. Some Pharisees who were with him heard him say this and asked, what are we blind to? Jesus said, if you were blind, you would not be guilty of sin. But now that you claim you can see, you your guilt remains. 
I want you to just trust me for 10 seconds, and I'm going to ask you, if, if you would like, to close your eyes for 10 seconds in silence. Okay, thank you. You may open your eyes. What did you see in those 10 seconds? You probably saw darkness. Imagine living in darkness, physical darkness, all your life. I have a picture up here on the screen of my nephew, Justin's son. His name is Alex Ray. He was born blind. I remember the day clearly when Justin found out and he called and said, Uncle, he's blind. I think he's blind. It was a tough year. It was hard to accept and embrace the reality that my son can't see when others can. He's in the third grade now. I was honored that he was named after me. His middle name is Ray. You see what he's doing? He's washing dishes, even though he's blind. I was visiting with him one day, and I said, so how you doing there, Alex? He said, I'm doing good. Hey, would you like to watch something with me? It kind of caught me off guard. I'm going like, okay, how am I going to watch something with him if he's blind? You see, he's been walking by faith all his life. He can see things even though he can't see things. I see things, and when he told me that, I didn't get it. I lacked spiritual understanding even though I have physical sight. You know what is worse than being physically blind? Being Spiritually blind all your life. See, Jesus came to correct our vision and give us spiritual sight. Because he already knows that if we never deal with our sin issue, guess what's going to happen? We're going to suffer the consequences, not just on this earth, but for eternity. Unless he corrects our sight, he cannot remove the penalty of sin. He cannot remove the power of sin. That is a spiritual problem that requires a spiritual solution. And so he wants us to open our spiritual eyes, if you will. Listen to what Paul the Apostle said in Ephesians chapter 1, 18 to 19. I pray also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is like the working of his mighty strength. You know what God is saying to the Apostle Paul, to the church? He's saying, listen, if you think physically seeing things is a powerful thing, you ought to try spiritual sight. Because you will see spiritual realities for what they are, which you can't see any other way. There's a very famous man by the name of John Newton. He was a slave trader. You know, this, this is one of those guys that would go and take people. Maybe they were out working on the farm and they would confiscate them. Okay, you can call it stealing a person's life. Then they would put them on a ship and send them somewhere else to serve as slaves elsewhere. And in the process, he realized he had an encounter with God. He had some spiritual insight, and he realized that he was a spiritual slave. And when he did, he ended up writing a song that we all very well know called Amazing Grace. Where he says, says in the song, I once was lost, but now am found, was blind, 
but now I see. If we've crossed over from the spiritual darkness, the spiritual kingdom of darkness to the spiritual kingdom of light, our eyes have been opened and we have spiritual sight. But we have much to be thankful to God for giving us that gift. And so we're going to end this service with a song, Amazing Grace, a modern version of it. And as we sing this song, I want you to ask yourself this question. Have you crossed over yet to what only God can give? And if you have crossed over and you have spiritual sight, but you haven't been using that spiritual corrected vision, you haven't been using the lens that God has given you, then it's time to reset. God didn't save you just so you could get into heaven, although that is true. God saved you so that you can help the rest of the world also be restored to what God intended life to be. So would you stand, and as we sing this song, would you think about the lyrics of the song? And as we sing this song, before we close in prayer, maybe you need to just say, God, thank you. I've been a little negligent with my appreciation for what I have. If you haven't made that transition yet, then maybe God is speaking to you, and and, and you're realizing, I need to, I need to, Make that turning point. Let's sing.